to episode 70 of the Naked Eye podcast. This is Nathan Oxenfeld coming to you today at the end of March 2023. In today's episode, I'm very excited to be able to sit down and chat with Fernanda Laita Ribeiro, who's an optometrist based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. She and I met at a few of the previous international holistic vision conferences. So you may have even heard me mention her name in one of my conference recap episodes in the past. She was also recently a guest reader on the Better Eyesight podcast in, I believe, the February episode. So if you want a little more from her, you can check that out. And in general, I encourage you to check out the Better Eyesight podcast at bettereyesightpodcast.com or patreon.com slash better eyesight. But one of Fernanda's specialties or main areas of interest is peripheral expansion and awareness, as well as binocularity or the ability of the two eyes to work together as a team to give us good stereoscopic vision or 3D vision, not just for the sake of our eyesight, but all the other implications in life that that can actually lead to. So that was a big focus of our talk today, but we also cover some other very helpful tips that may enlighten you to some new approaches to natural vision improvement or just some variations or tweaks on things that maybe you've tried before. Also got some good feedback of my recent Better or, uh, Bates Method 101 video called How to See Without Glasses where I do a nice little fireside chat with you and it even features my dog in it. And I think you just saw my cat pop into frame as well. There he is. <laughs> so anyway, just been trying to stay busy and continue to put out some new materials and content for you to continue studying the Bates method, various approaches to natural vision improvement and just healing on all levels. So if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, definitely do that. Subscribe to the Naked Eye podcast on your podcast apps and love getting interaction in the comments or if people leave any kind of ratings or reviews that also helps in a big way as well. That's about all for now. I just wanted to give a quick little intro for Fernanda and I'm really excited for you to listen to my full conversation with Fernanda Laita Ribeiro. Enjoy. Hello, welcome to the Naked Eye podcast, Fernanda. Very happy to have you on. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here this time. Yeah, I had a lot of fun talking with you and Claudia last month for our February 1923 Better Eyesight podcast episode. And I just felt an urge to invite you on the Naked Eye podcast just to get a little bit more of your story and your experience. Because in the Better Eyesight podcast, we got kind of a firsthand example of, of your perspective and the way you approach vision work. Um, but I'm really curious just to learn even more about you and your experience and kind of digging a little bit deeper today into maybe some of your focus or specialty in uh, in how you work with vision. So do you want to maybe start off with kind of sharing a little bit about your journey of, of what brought you to this point? Great. Yes, yes. And I love to start that way because... Um, I feel that, well, each, each one of us, all vision educators, I think we are caught by this work in a different way, but it's always through the heart. <laughs> That's my feeling, actually. Yeah. And it happened to me, too. Uh, I was a professional dancer, and I, I was a myopic who always wore my glasses. I, I never complained about it. And then I met Mayer Schneider by chance, completely by chance, because he was brought to Brazil by uh, a niece of mine who had a physical problem. So the idea was more problems of the body that brought him here. Hmm. And I went to his lecture just to, in a friendly way, just to, to help her. And... Yeah. I didn't like at first the idea of working with the eyes. Oh, come on to get rid of my glasses. I feel so good with it. You know, <laughs> it was just the opposite. But then I saw myself 
taking his course in his class, to taking the whole program, that body work and vision work. And first thing he did was take away your glasses right now. And 10 days, I was without my glasses, suffering a lot, mm. and especially my dark glasses, because I loved it. <laughs> this is the point. Oh, the sunglasses? Uh, yeah, sunglasses. Yeah. Because the thing is, I always say to people, I didn't choose this work. This work chose me mm. because I was very reactive to everything. But then during the course, all of a sudden, it, I had a click. Mm. It was exactly a click. Like this is a this is not just a work to see better. This is something that I work on myself to be a better person. It was amazing. How was uh, strong this click? Mm. Why is that? Because I understood the, the the level of attention on myself that I had to do. The the way I had to dig into my own things, my own habits, my things that I, that I just passed by without noticing. And so to bring, uh, uh, to, to bring into consciousness, and that really caught me. So I started doing the work and I was, uh, I, I must say that I was all actually bold enough to start dealing with patients, with people who looked for me because Meir is very strong when you talk about vision work and then many people with lots of big problems came to me yeah. and all of a sudden I saw myself having to help them. And it was not because I was good. It's just because I was the only one here who really accepted the challenge to work with people with vision problems. Mm. So we started with that and then it was like a, a love affair. I started seeing changes and how people also change their behavior, but not only the behavior, but their being, uh, accepting the differences. So it was really striking. And then for 10 years, I built my practice here in Brazil. Uh, uh, I had a room, a very nice room in a very, very nice house with a huge backyard with fruit trees and fountains and everything. So we had a very good site for, uh, for vision work. And during 10 years, that was it. Yeah. Then I met Ray Gottlieb in the uh, United States in a conference that Mayer held in San Francisco. And I fell in love with Ray, <laughs> actually. He's such a nice guy, such a generous teacher. And um, I wanted very much to study syntonics, which is uh, the, the technique he is very fond of. And he told me, well, but for that, you might need to become, you might become an optometrist because uh, syntonics, now we teach for everyone, but in the near future, that's not gonna happen anymore. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I looked for a course in Brazil uh, for, to study optometry, optometry, uh, practically didn't exist in Brazil. There were many optometrists working, but uh, not. Uh, it's not accepted in the mainstream. And mm -hmm. if you talk about optometry in Brazil, people say, what to what? What is that? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> <You know? laughs> still now, <laughs> still now. Uh, it's like that. Yeah. But anyway, I took a course. It's not any close to the optometry courses you have in the US. Uh, it's much more simple, uh, and I never got a practice to do a real optometry. I learned how to do refraction. I learned to, to do a retinoscopy. I learned to, to deal with those tools, but that was not my goal. My goal was to understand better, to, to get more uh, understanding of the visual system so I could create more on the behalf of my clients. That was the main idea. Yeah. And also to study syntonics. Yeah. And then I put syntonics in my life. And right after that, or some years after that, uh, there, uh, it happened the first behavior optometry uh, course in Brazil. And I took it from Dr. Robert Sennett, mm. which I met, who I met 
in St. Onyx also. So he was already my friend. And so I took it and that behavioral optometry, I, I'll never become a behavioral optometry. That's not my interest. I, I don't like to use tools like lenses, prisms, or things even for therapy, mm -hmm. but I could understand much better the problems of binocularity, uh, learning from, him, from them, uh, from Robert Sennett and Pilar Vergara. So syntonics is also a technique that deals a lot with binocular problems. Yeah. And, and, and also behavioral optometry. It's one of the, the strong points for behavior optometries to work on binocularity. Mm -hmm. So after that, I put in my life a lo lots of principles that came out of those techniques. And so I could add in my practice more and more of that. Mm -hmm. This is me. <laughs> and so I, I, I try to make like, my basis is self-healing method. Um, I really believe in this natural vision improvement thing. It's not the, the idea of uh, using tools sometimes temporary can be. I understood some things that I, I think might be a shortcut. But anyway, um, these are this is my like my toolbox. Yeah, that's and, amazing how you kind of tied it all together there in kind of chronological order to see how the different pieces fit together. And also fascinated how, even though you just said it's rooted in this self-healing thing, sound, sounded like even before that, it, it was even rooted in just art and dance and movement as an even more kind of fundamental basis, which then, as people may know, if they study the Bates system or the natural vision improvement, movement is really important <laughs> when it comes to oh, vision too. Oh, and, um, and, and you know what? I think that you... Everything you do in your life, any any subject you studied in your life, you can add to the work you're doing. Uh, so uh, my my background in dance helps me so much. It's amazing because there is so much understanding of the visual system together with body movement. Uh, many cues we we as dancers had to use using our eyes to be able to be in balance or this opening of periphery to be able to be on one foot, things like that, yeah. or to do turns. How, how do you shift your point of fixation when you're turning? So I had all these kind of skills and then I, I could put the pieces together mm -hmm. and it was very nice. And also I have a background in, in, in history. I, I, mm. I, that's what I studied. And I don't know, somehow, uh, this also fits in as like a humanistic approach uh, mm -hmm. and you, you, you just get away a little bit with health problems only and you, you just make something in your feeling that comes out when you learn things uh, in this kind of field now of humanities and stuff. I don't know. It's I, in the background, but it works. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. Because, yeah, I studied anthropology and I feel like that in one way or another has sort of shaped the way that I, I look at vision and, and that I teach the vision work as well. And, yeah, just fascinated by studying people and <laughs> how people work. But it, just in case people are not uh, familiar with syntonics, it did come up in a recent episode with uh, Dr. Sam Byrne who's also involved in the syntonic optometry world. And I've also had Dr. Ray Gottlieb on, on the show before. Um, we were also talking a little bit more about some of the 3D vision and more of the mental visualizations and relaxation. Um, so do you want to just give a, a, a quick little reminder of, of what syntonics is? Okay. Well, syntonics is, uh, the, the big name is uh, optometric phototherapy syntonics. And it's the application of light or filters, uh, light that is filtered by some uh, filters uh, to, to uh, select some frequencies uh, mm -hmm. uh, among the, the, the full spectrum of light. Or else, let me put it yeah. better. Um, to work with the dysfunctions of the visual system, 
we use the, the lights that coming into the eyes in a way that we can select some uh, frequencies. So we put colored filters uh, in front of the eyes and we uh, uh, sunbait or sunbait, no, uh, with a light. So we use the light to, to, to reset the system. It's something like that. You, you work on the, on the level of uh, a subcortical level, right? in, the, in a level where you have conditioned responses. And so this will uh, interfere in the way you're doing accommodation, virtual movements. It's going to open your field of vision, your spatial vision, and then will bring back lots of uh, more possibilities of stereo vision. So we work a lot, a lot with amblyopias, which is one, when the two eyes don't work together well. And also with strabismus, now squinting a lot. And also learning problems, the kids with learning disabilities very much. Yeah, so yeah. So. That was that was my <clears throat> one of my big takeaways from the Syntonics, you know, 101 course was its effect on the central nervous system. And if maybe someone is a little overly sympathetic, we can use certain colored lights to maybe bring the nervous system into more syntony or harmony. And, and then maybe if somebody's overly parasympathetic or, or under sympathetic, we can kind of use a different set of, of colored light to kind of activate. And I, I guess kind of find this more sort of homeostasis, but that, that word you said, expand, you know, vision that, that was what I, I, was reminded of when I was going through some of the notes I was taking from the talk that you gave at the Latin American holistic vision conference in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I think the, the title of the talk was either expanding vision yes. um, or, or ha like how, how to expand vision. And I was, you know, I always like to kind of come up with like a, a title for these podcast episodes. Um, and before I found the notes that I was taking, I was thinking about maybe calling this episode two eyes, three dimensions. Ooh, um, <laughs> that's since, nice. since it's like, you know, it sounds like a lot of what you've already shared is this emphasis on binocular vision, stereoscopic vision, three dimensional vision. Um, and I'm kind of curious if, if you have, a personal experience of your like going from more maybe two dimensional vision to three dimensional vision or having an experience of like a, a deepening of your depth perception, or uh, I guess I'm kind of curious, are, are you drawn to this topic for personal reasons or is it something that you got really excited when you saw it working for other people or a little bit of both? Yes. Um, I have the experience with myself and this was the thing that, uh, uh, that put me since the beginning in this work because I started working on myself and from the work on myself I could understand it in others that's for me that's the only way I can I can drive myself through uh, all these uh, all these things and okay I'm myopic but minus two myopic is not nothing terrible uh, facing what we see you know the day by day work but I could understand how much unbalance, uh, you, you, let me start again. You were talking about uh, how syntonics work in our lives and true. We are always trying to balance sympathetic and parasympathetic um, uh, systems and also the endocrine system that works the same way, uh, but in a different, with different, um, um, materials now like uh, with hormones and the other is electrical let's say like that right. mm -hmm. but anyway we we are always searching for balance our brain is always trying to put us in balance because life and our relationship internal and external is always a, a movement in this direction i go i have to go through stress and i have to relax i have to because life calls us that and it's a survival 
we, we have to be able to take lots of stress and to come back into balance, right? Or to depress and then come back into balance. When we work with vision, uh, we are dealing with that the whole time. The visual system is completely intimate with these systems. Actually, it's ruled by the, its systems. And then I started seeing that on myself. And see that, although I have two eyes that work together, I never had a big binocular problem. Although I can read without my glasses, I can look for without my glasses, I can see that very often I have an imbalance. And it's a very strange shift of, of paradigm because you feel like, oh, no, I'm okay. My vision is not a problem for me. Of course it is. Just to give you one, one example. When I was uh, studying behavior optometry, we used to, uh, we were doing uh, an exercise with vectograms. Vectograms are um, uh, some, how do you say, sheets, uh, not sheets, it's a transparent. Uh, yeah, like a transparency paper? Yes. Uh, two diff uh, similar images that you, you slide them uh, like this. And if you slide in one side, you will, you will see divergency through. If you, see, if you shift in another direction, you, the, the things will converge and will bring the relief towards you or um, uh, uh, far from you. Mm -hmm. And you have to use polarized glasses to do this kind of, of thing. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with divergency and we had this glued on uh, in the glass window. Then I saw myself, who was a very good divergent person, to not be able to do that at all. Mm. Why is that? That's because even me that keeps saying that every day to my clients, you look uh, close too much, you have to look far, you have to look far, I caught myself. <laughs> Deficient on that too. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because we are called to, to be in near vision so much, so much that even us sometimes are part in one of these things. So I saw that I had less flexibility and I couldn't stand that. So I practiced, 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 practiced and I could rearrange my uh, capacity of being very divergent. Mm. The flexibility, converging and diverging, this is one thing that we have to do, and this is the result for stereopsis. So we say, I have stereopsis, you have stereopsis. But there are levels, levels, and levels, and levels of stereopsis. We all can get by. We all that learn since our developmental period how to deal with uh, 3D vision, for us, it's easy. We, we don't need explanations. We, we just go by. But that doesn't mean good quality. Mm -hmm. you, you can, and, and that you see when you do some exercise that has to put you um, studying your flexibility. And that's what happened that day. And then I saw others uh, in other situations I could see, and one thing that I always check myself, I'm going to show you. Because uh, the 3D vision depends very much on how the, the both eyes are working together in which kind of quality, mm -hmm. uh, how much suppression you have, uh, uh, it's happening. And suppression happens all the time. Like right. one eye suppressing versus the other eye? Yes, but sometimes just a Peace, just an intermittence, just um, lowering uh, what comes from one eye to preserve the other one. If you have to read something, I'm going to give you this an example, but that's what happens mostly with people with presbyopia. Yeah. I can read, it's fine, but one eye is stronger, not because of visual acuity only, 
but also because of dominance. And in presbyopia, I have to use more of my power of discrimination than when I had more flexibility. I'm losing flexibility because of the presbyopia. So the, the answers of my system, the accommodative system are not so fast. And what the brain chooses to do is what is faster, not what is better. And that's the point. So, so it be faster to maybe just suppress one eye and have the other one read at it. At that minute, only at that minute in that situation. So for instance, if I get, I have a here, a broad string. I'm not using it as a broad string. I'm just leaving the beats okay. behind. And I'm looking at your nose. Pretend that I'm reading a test. And then I put at the distance that I'm using to read and I look at your nose and I have the physiological diplopia, which means uh, when we look at one point, everything that stands uh, between my eyes and the point of fixation that I'm doing has to double. The brain suppresses this all the time mm -hmm. because it was going to be a mess in our lives if we had all those things. So it's his business to suppress. But then when you do this, you break the suppression, it comes into consciousness. And I can understand how much each eye is participating of that specific task. And then I see how much one eye is much stronger than the other one. And it's not a matter only of visual acuity. Sometimes it is. Yeah. But the difference, when you have this kind of difference, you are penalizing stereopsis. You, are, have it, you have the stereopsis, but you don't have the whole depth perception that you are uh, capable of. Yeah, I think that's important to hear that it's not like you just either have 3D vision or you don't. It's like there's so many levels to it where, uh, I mean, even technically, if you only have one eye, you, you still have some level of of depth gauging and perception. Obviously, with two eyes, it it enhances it entirely but but yeah that that was really important for me to hear because like when i learned about initially about binocular vision stereo stereo fields and everything it was like that's not really a i don't need to work on that i already have 3d vision i already have depth perception but then like playing with the brock string or some of these other stereo pairs and stereograms it really unlocked this new level that i didn't really realize that i could experience and um and i get that question a lot from my students when they're playing with the brock string it, and they start to see that double rope you know if they're looking out at the end of the rope and it looks like the two ropes coming towards them mm -hmm. a lot of times it'll be one is much darker than the other the other one is is kind of coming in and out fading in and out and um and so that that was a great explanation of how the brain in everyday life is like supposed to tune out that kind of optical illusion of the double effect but when we do these particular depth perception stimulating things we're actually looking for it and kind of like noticing that optical effect that that shows up yeah yeah and of course here we're not dealing directly with that perception but, but with the principles that come to help us to do and uh, when you when you're doing this and you have both eyes working well, no problem. And you do this and you see one uh, row much stronger than the other one. It's normal that if you do a movement like this, just just a movement and keep watch, keep looking at it. Do some, you know, anywhere. All of a sudden, everything fits in place. Why is that? because of your periphery, mm. because of your spatial vision. Your spatial vision was enhanced with movement. Mm -hmm. And as you got some movement, you got it more uh, together, yeah. both eyes more together. So when you do the big shifting, that one that 
we were in, in the podcast talking about the big one when we are very, this is a very good tool to bring at those moments. So when I catch myself, returning to the beginning of your question, when I catch myself doing this thing, hmm, I'm just using one eye. Of course I'm using both, but so much more. This I, I just go out and do some shifting, the big one, because I want to, yeah. to do the parallax movement very, or in my row of my chair here, mm -hmm. I do some strong, or even, even I use the shifter, this homemade, fast homemade shifter, and I do this. Nice. So I move my periphery. Yeah. Just a little bit. Yeah, you have the good one. <laughs> This one is like any paper you have in your desk, you just fold and cut and you have a shifter. <laughs> nice. I like it. It's pretty. So no excuse for anyone, you know? Right. This is this is one thing that I'm very expert, is to find easy ways for people not come to me and say, oh, but I couldn't do it because there wasn't time or there wasn't sun or this or that. I'm expert on dealing with this kind of situations and finding a very easy way for the person to do and That's be important. ashamed of themselves when they come and say that I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> That that's why I love the um the gate posts practice uh with just the finger. Uh, because I, I mean having a rope or a string is an awesome tool and a, a you know indicator there, but just to have that finger vertically right up in oh, front yeah. of the nose. Yeah. And and it's like one of my favorite practices for people to check in with their binocularity because for the people who only see one finger, but you know, they're not looking at the finger, they're looking past the finger, which should create that double effect. But if it's not there, then I'll usually have them close one eye at a time and see the finger jump side to side. And honestly, it's one of my favorite things to kind of witness or or experience when I'm in a session with someone who is experiencing a suppression and they're only seeing one finger or the other. I mean, technically there is only one finger, but it's that optical illusion that it looks like two. And then with not only the closing one eye at a time, but like you started moving the Brock string around, I'll usually have them swing their head or maybe wiggle the finger a little bit. And within a few seconds or minutes, they get they get the appearance, they get the double, and they almost kind of like are like, whoa, it because it because like you said, they're so used to it being kind of suppressed, and then it it appears and it might kind of feel strange and different so i wonder if if that's an element too of kind of kind of like with the visual acuity learning how to relax into seeing clearly maybe we also have to kind of learn how to relax into seeing 3d and having that kind of maintain because i imagine if it's a habit to suppress it may kind of pop in like a clear flash and then kind of flatten out a little bit or something but i'm seeing seeing some similarities there there no, yes. And also, yes, so you, you reminded me of the finger also because I, I used to put like one finger here and I have two natans and then I have one natan and two fingers and you always can move the finger like that too. Yeah. And then you, you have the perfect idea. So the whole thing is to bring into consciousness, to watch your your system doing things. You, you really watching your processes. And then, of course, you want vision to be automatic. You want vision not to bother you, to be just a nice thing and you can just, you know, enjoy the world and look at things and deal with the whole environment without having to worry about that. That's uh, the synonym of a good vision. But unfortunately, we are made of habits and habits bring some routines and routines tend to shorten through life. And then you, we, we just end up with smaller and um, uh, narrower routines and that can disorganize because we lose, um, we lose the magic, we lose the mm -hmm. sense. And uh, so, but what worries me, and it's a really worry, and I remember in that lecture in Argentina, 
I remember starting with a slide of South Koreans, like a hundred guys of 18 years old in a high school looking far with their glasses and the hundred was wearing glasses and uh, seeing how much myopia came to stay and to, to stay in the, and I really believe that in the near future we will be myopics uh, as uh, natural, <laughs> that was the, it would be the point of balance for the whole humanity, I think. If we keep on habits like that, we have to change our system, yeah. you know, right? Near vision matches very much with um, with myopia. And I'm not saying that, so uh, when I work with refractive errors, even thinking of a myopia or hyperopia, hyperopia is a little more tricky in this sense, but anyway, the idea is a narrowing of space. I don't think anymore on myopia or hyperopia or any or astigmatism as problems of central vision that uh, your focus is not well here or there. I'm thinking about how space expands and shrinks. And if you think, if you change your paradigm and you think, that when you look close, you are doing this with your whole periphery. And when mm -hmm. you go out, you are just expanding your periphery. Yeah. You shift the way you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. And when you have a good sense of periphery, you have an easy focus. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. that the tendency is the focus to be much more, uh, much easier because you know exactly where you're aiming to. Your system understands the distance perfectly because you have a, a, a basis, you have uh, the one who told you where you are and where things are. So you, you have the distance. Yeah, more yeah. context. Yes, yes. So when you think about contest doing this and you feel and you, you see that you have to open up and when you open periphery, you see that. One example, um, we all work, you work and I do also with the token. Yeah, this Saturn here. Yeah, the field you, divider. Yeah, field divider, yeah, you, you do better than me. I call this the, the token. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, we used to use that on a stick Mm -hmm. and just go around looking yeah. and then i decided this is the a way of the making things easier i, mm -hmm. I decided to do this in this elastic band and then adapt to the to the eyes so i can have my hands free yeah and what i what i do with this this works the same way as the broad string mm -hmm. have the, the diplopia, the, the double vision uh, physiological, when you look far, you see like a, a space between two um, uh, plates, right? Mm -hmm. And they change color, so you have the awareness that you are seeing those two, uh, each eye, uh, which eye is looking at uh, participating of this, the scene. The mm -hmm. same thing as we did here. But on the other hand, when we play balls, we do coordination exercises, we do things with this, keeping the awareness of both eyes being used in the way they are, they can be used together. The, the more partnership, the better. But this, when you take it out and you go to the eye chart, you will see two lines below. Mm. It's like almost always, if yeah. you don't have any disease, anything that can prevent you to, from doing it, just by opening periphery, because this opens periphery. Why does it open periphery? Because you, you're not, when you're playing balls, when you're doing things, you are not uh, asking the system to be specific in central vision, mm -hmm. right? It's just uh, in a broad sense. It has to look at the, uh, it has to look at the ball, but not letter, a small letter or a dot or something. Right. 
So it's a working periphery, working periphery, and then you freeing your eye. At the same time, you bring it partnership, partnership, both eyes together, fusing periphery. And then you go to the eye chart and you have to do a very central work there. Mm -hmm. and have your periphery helping you to see centrally. And that's why today, the way I work with my clients, of course, each one at, at his own level and possibilities and everything, but my thinking is always to look for uh, binocularity. How both eyes can work together here in the best way. And so I go on with this idea uh, in my mind. And of course, I'll have to pat one eye, we'll have to do everything we do. But the idea is as soon as possible, both eyes together, both eyes together. Stereopsis, a little bit of stereopsis will bring the system into balance. And then I don't need to cut it in many exercises. Right. So you can just do that. Yeah. And if you improve stereopsis, your ocular movements will be better and your accommodation will be better and everything will happen. Yeah, that's really powerful because I think that a lot of times when we first, especially when we first learn about this work, we're not really thinking about our peripheral vision. We're really like more interested in our visual acuity in the center. And that's kind of the hallmark for success is like, oh, well, I want that 2020 vision. And what's kind of neat is you just explained very, very nicely how that 2020 central vision can potentially occur as a result of the periphery. And, and that was one of my favorite quotes from you that I wrote down from your talk. I'll just quote you. You said myopia is a problem with the periphery expressed in the central. And yes. that, that really just rung true to me because it really, it, se it seemed like a missing piece. You know, like I remember when I asked my eye doctor why I was myopic, they said it's because of genes, you know, it's genetic. Mm -hmm. And you just gave a more kind of functional explanation of, you know, that certainly may be a factor, but maybe there's a, some issue with your periphery. And, and I think we can break that down into two levels, because this was also something else you said in your workshop uh, was about kind of the, the complication of adding glasses into the mix, because my myopia probably developed because of some peripheral collapse or constriction. And then that peripheral issue affected my central vision. And then I need, I got the glasses, which, um, well, first, first of all, you know, since I w didn't have the periphery as much, I, I was kind of maybe putting more pressure on the center to try and see because it was getting blurry. Then the glasses came in and created another border and, and kind of ignored the periphery to another level and brought even more hyper-focus in just on the middle part. And it kind of created that vicious cycle until I took my glasses off like you did at Mayor's workshop. You know, I, I spent days or, or weeks without wearing the glasses like I had my whole life. And it was like rediscovering this lost piece of myself, this periphery that I wasn't really engaging with to the extent that I do now. True. And just one thing that I remember that I wanted to tell you many other times, <laughs> maybe Schneider, in many, many classes I took from him, always not wearing my glasses. And then I, start, I learned how not to wear my glasses and all. But sometimes he would look at my eyes with his eyes and people who know Mir Schneider knows that he is a person with a very particular way of seeing things. And he would look at me and say, go outside, look far. Your eyes are looking very myopic today. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I said, how can you see this? <laughs> But anyway, well, I, I think that's a perfect prompt for, for anybody who's either listening or watching this right now to look in the distance, you know, just 
find sure. a window, find something, you know, like all about that whole practicing what we preach. And, and it can be ironic that sometimes somebody can like watch a one hour video about vision improvement without looking into the distance. <laughs> so it's, it's, we want to kind of integrate and incorporate these things into our, into our activities. We don't want to be guilty that you are looking close for one hour in a row. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's very much true. But yeah, I, I remember playing with that field divider at your workshop and throwing scarves and balloons up in the air. And there, we were all walking around, not trying to hit each other. And, you know, even some with the Melissa patches and, and it, it it's so is that kind of all designed to pretty much wake up that peripheral awareness and that consciousness of, of that wider field, would you say? Yes, and but you don't need to go all that way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I, I I tend, as I as I told you, I tend to help people to see if their daily basis, their daily lives, in their routines, they do this. So every time people look far, I ask them to look far with this, using this, to do um, housekeeping, using this. So practical things and people who are uh, courageous enough to go out on the street wearing this and not not with the fear of being arrested or something or being a crazy one on the streets to walk and sensing the optic flow so you walk as you walk you just point your central vision to far distance not paying attention at the far distance. Because normally, interrupting a little bit, normally when we walk, we are not watching, we are not seeing anything. We are sensing things, but we are not really seeing. We are seeing inside, we are thinking. We yeah. are like daydreaming or solving problems. We are talking to ourselves all the time. We are not really contemplating. Mm -hmm. When you work on your periphery consciously, because a periphery is something subliminal, it's not conscious work. It's a basis for your conscious work. So you, when you walk on the streets and just feel the optic flow, put yourself walking and feeling the floor that is passing, the trees that is passing by you, the branches, everything, as if you were in a rolling stair, not stair, um, uh, curb, when you have that thing, how do you call that? It's not a rolling stair. Was Oh yeah, like, in, like at the airport, like yeah. the, the flat yes. escalator thing. The as walkway. if you had that, you were uh, there and the, the world was flowing. Even things that are right in front of you, because just remembering periphery is not sides, it's everything, everything. So when you wake this up and you walk, feeling this movement, first thing that happens to you, you have to lower a little bit your internal talking. Otherwise, you won't be able to do this. Your central vision always calls you to go inside and think of things like, I saw a car passing by and I said, oh my goodness, I forgot to, to change the oil of my car. <laughs> or somebody wearing red and I said, oh uh, my good, you think of something else. When you're on periphery, you have to pay attention on yourself. So you feel your body, you feel yourself, you feel the movement. And when you finish that, you did a meditation walking, <laughs> yeah. like walking meditation. You open your periphery and you improve your central vision this way. If you are wearing this with balance, yeah. of both eyes, you don't need to go on walking on the street with this. You just you, you can be uh, disguised on, as any person. <laughs> you don't need to show off yourself. <laughs> but when you do with this, it really enhances the experience. Yeah. One last thing that I wanted to say, to say when you're talking about myopia and this shrinking and this closing in on you of 
the whole world, the whole thing, and why uh, this brings more myopia. Hmm. When you're, you're wearing myopic glasses, uh, the lenses, it's not only the frame that is causing you uh, this collapse of uh, periphery, but the lenses, the, uh, remember, the lenses of a myopic person are much thicker um, at the sides and they are thinner in the center, like two triangles, that two prisms that meet together at the vertex here. The bases yeah. are here. And the image slides to the vertex. Mm -hmm. So you close your world, you bring everything in with those lenses. Yeah. You track your world. And that's why when we, when you take away um, many myopic people have the, the same feeling. And I, I, I bet you did to more colorful, bigger, um, broader, and sometimes um, challenging because mm -hmm. myopic love to be in control in that tiny place they know how to deal. That's the point. Yeah. And I can certainly imagine that if that, if that kind of mentality, because that after wearing glasses and contacts for so many years, I kind of got conditioned to, yeah, operate that way, look that way, expect, you know, to see things that way. So when I took the glasses off, it, if I would have just kind of kept that operating system going, things probably would have just sort of stayed the same, if not gotten worse. But luckily, a lot of the, the Bates work gave me an out and an alternative path to go and and realize oh it it there is this other way of seeing that doesn't use the glasses doesn't use the contacts and it's actually more true to the actual world the the light coming into the eye without being bent and 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 you know curved through the lens into the eye artificially yes and every time you were wearing glasses you can see how uh, harmful it can be because it worsens your vision, it weakens your vision. And this is for me so much true because of course I am presbyopic. Of course I have my lens not the way it was in the past because we are made of collagen, collagen changes and uh, so does the lens, no way, but how to get by with that, how to adapt in the best way possible. And uh, I have a pair of presbyo presbyopia glasses that I wear very, very, very seldom in one action that I need and then I just take it away. If I, I for something or, or if I'm very much stressed and I'm not dealing well and I have to, to take the glasses for me, after one hour or I don't know how much time, I'm seeing so much worse. And not so much worse just for one hour, just for one day, two days. So it's a whole thing you have to do. Yeah. So I, this is one thing, like, I don't, I don't want to be dogmatic. Uh, if you need a little bit as a tool, okay, you need, that's your point, that's your story. And, but you, you pay a price. Just need to know that you pay a price. And it's okay. And then you shift to the other way. It's fine. But I hate it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's actually, I hate it. And yeah. I'm not very much okay. But, you know, you, know, you don't, you, 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 we are not able to live um, our lives without going a little bit too much on stress sometimes. Oops, no way. Yeah, I, I I appreciate that that flexible mentality because I I feel like that's could be a, a detriment if people maybe take either Doctor Bates's or in your case, you know, Mayor Schneider telling you to to leave the glasses off for ten days straight. Um, yeah, to to just be flexible with it, and and that's definitely the approach I took. Is I knew that there was that cold turkey approach of just breaking my glasses in half, throwing them, throwing them away, never putting them on again. 
but I didn't choose that. I chose to use the glasses when I needed them or when I noticed more stress coming in. And I understood that that was going to probably draw out the process. It was probably going to take longer, but it led to more enjoyment of my life <laughs> because I, I I wasn't limiting, I wasn't holding myself back from, oh, I can't drive there or I can't see this person across the room or, you know, I don't want to go to this social thing or whatever. So it's just like, yeah, pick and choose and, and, uh, and be very flexible about it and rest assured that people like us are, are out here, you know, talking about ways to bring the vision back. If you do need to use the glasses and you feel like it kind of dips you back down, or I don't like to use that word backtracking because I, I feel like it does make the vision worse temporarily, but there tends to be that kind of spring back or that bounce back. Um, hopefully with more time and practice, people find ways to kind of spring back or bounce back faster um, without there being such a lag from the effect of the glasses. But that was why I appreciated that chapter in Dr. Bates's book, what glasses do to us. Um, cause it really just got me thinking about, wow, I've been wearing these things almost my whole life and nobody ever told me <laughs> that the, you know, that these could have this, this negative side effect. It was just all, you know, go ahead and wear them 24 seven for the rest of your life. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. But, uh, on the other hand, it's funny because, uh, we pay a price anyhow, uh, it, stress comes to us. Yeah. Um, in a way that you can take it all for you and work on yourself um, and you're not you're wearing your glass, your brain is adapting in a way as we were talking in the beginning, suppressing a little bit one eye, doing all, something is going to be done because it can take it all, all yeah. at once. But it's nice to watch the process, to be aware of that and to be willing to change. Uh, one thing Mayor Schneider told me in the very, very beginning, I was this person who wasn't in the field of uh, health field and no, not knowing if I was going to be a good person working with other people. He told me, no, the only thing you need to be is a person in transformation or somebody who wants to, to transform yourself. And I think that natural vision improvement has a lot to do with that. You, you, you don't teach anyone. You don't teach everybody. You teach who wants to change. And you have to be also this person, changing all the time and dealing with your own stuff. We are people too. We are not gods that are teaching poor um, mortals how, how to deal with their vision. Right? right. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's so spot on. Yeah, because I, I feel like that's, partly what why I resonated with my teacher Jerry Ann Tabor because I knew she was in my shoes and and she had been through the process and um yeah that personal experience uh to be able to kind of relate with mentioning mayor and this thing about adaptation you know what can I do to adapt versus just kind of take the conventional route that was something that um we included in our documentary the vision 2020 documentary um, where we interviewed Mayor, and towards the, I think it's towards the very beginning of the film, it's just a little quote of him talking about sunlight and how important it is to learn how to adapt to the bright light as opposed to just using those dark glasses to shield ourselves from the light. Um, so that you, you were kind of talking about that with when it comes to presbyopia or reading, you know, it's like, okay, just and people can apply that to anything. It's like, what can I do to adapt versus thinking about what kind of crutches or band-aids I can kind of reach for. Um, so I think that's just an important sort of mindset to to bring, no matter what people are focusing on. Yes, perfectly. Yes. We, uh, this is the, the real good thinking uh, because we always think that we need crutches. Oh, no, but I need this. I need that. Okay. Uh, we, we have this modulation of our um, uh, autonomic nervous system always, uh, and the world is here uh, always asking us to go beyond, to go beyond, to, to, to break our limits and everything. 
But we have to be honest with ourselves. What do we want? We want for us. And when we adapt, when we adapt in the best way possible, it's really a matter of training. We have to train ourselves to do the to the right choices. Otherwise, we're just gonna dive into the, the the first thing that comes to us. And I think this is very much about this. Now, nah? oh, uh, I remember first time I had to not wear my sunglasses on the street. My pupils all died open. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know how to how to shrink. So I was crying days and days and days. It was so uncomfortable, so horrible. But I really wanted to experiment that. I I really wanted not be a hostage of that that tool. I didn't. I hadn't uh, the awareness of how much harm it was doing to me. So that's the point. We have to really feel that that's not good for us. Otherwise, on, on the contrary, you you may very well have been believing that these are good for me and the, these are necessary for my eye health because yeah. that's pretty much the narrative we <laughs> we hear a lot from from the conventional side of it, but. But yeah, when you really think about like, wow, these glasses are weakening the sphincter muscles in my iris and, and you know, making them unable to constrict to the level that they need to. It's like you start to maybe think about using them differently or less or maybe trying less lightly, you know, more lightly tinted lenses or maybe switching to like a yellow pair as like an in-between to kind of help the eyes adjust. Um, but but yeah, it's, I think that was another thing that I was impressed to see that syntonics can also help with is yeah. just this whole pupillary response and, and really getting the those muscles to get back in action. And you see, uh, the pupillary response has a direct influence on the, the peripheral field. Yeah. So the wider, the shrinker, <laughs> the, the less uh, opening, the field is more collapsed. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's the first um, relationship. And so it's interesting right. because if you see a person who can't uh, um, respond, the pupils can't respond to light. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you will check on a plot in the field and everything, but you know already that yeah. this person will, you expect at least will have a very small field of yeah. uh, perception. It's not that there is a disease there or anything. No, it's just that the field, that functionally, it's not there for you. Mm -hmm. That's the point. It's not there for you. Yeah, that, that came up a lot also in the syntonics training of, um, I think in the past when, when people would talk about a constricted visual field, I kind of had in my mind, you know, this big wide picture where maybe if like, if I were to look through an empty paper towel roll and I look through this, it's just a much smaller circle. So it's like the same kind of central vision. And then it's like black around the edges or like, you know, maybe the brain isn't really getting it or perceiving it, but what I really appreciated it being explained a little differently was like actually taking the entire thing and just kind of squeezing it in and kind of compressing it actually, um, which I hadn't really almost more like a fisheye lens kind of effect where, you know, it kind of almost distorts it in some way. Um, so yeah, it, it was interesting to kind of think about the different, cause I know that there is also just vision loss or, or, there could be areas in the periphery that aren't functioning as well, but yeah, that, that whole kind of field constriction or, or compression was sort of a novel idea to me. It's, it's the, the field that tells you how well you're going to walk on the street, for instance. Yeah. How well, can you bike through the cars mm -hmm. at that moment? you will widen a little bit because you are aware, you are paying attention, you, you can't be distracted. But if you're walking on the street and you are thinking, 
Just giving mm. two examples, but very simple. Right. We're thinking on something, other things in your life, and just walking. And then you bump into people, you just, you know, you're not aware of your surroundings. It's more or less like that. The idea is the field is there, the big field. Okay, if you do this, you're going to see. But what you're grasping from the world, what is there for you that you relate with? And then you have this small field. Mm. Kids with learning disabilities is this big. Right. They, right. No problem. No vision problems in terms of structure. Right. Yeah. Because you go to the eye doctor and, and get your vision tested and it's like, oh, it's fine. You know, there's nothing. Perfect. Maybe if people are listening to this and they're kind of curious to to maybe learn more about their peripheral, the status of their peripheral vision or uh, usually I like in the context of syntonics, I usually like to send people to like the CSO vision.org, just the college of syntonic optometry website, uh, just for like more information. And they have a good, like, um, practitioner list that you can search, um, if you want to kind of explore that more. Um, but yeah, like what, um, whether it's, um, you know, pointing people to your website or your information or, um, what advice you might give to somebody who wants to kind of just learn more about all this stuff in general. Uh, well, <laughs> I have to confess that I, I don't have a website. <laughs> this is one problem that I have. Actually, I do have one made by a colleague, Jack Ledesma. She, I, I taught a workshop uh, for Argentina and Spain uh, online. And she built something for me, but it's only in Spanish at the moment because I didn't do my homework, which was to translate that into English and into Portuguese, which is my own language, and I didn't do. So Well, luckily, Google did it for you because when I pull it up, um, you can hit the translate to English button, and it does a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> There's one problem. I tried to do so, but then it changes um, mm some things in the translation that are not good and then I can't change because if I change in English, right. I change in Spanish and then I can, you know? Right. So yeah. I still, uh, that's why I, I'm still dealing with that. So I have no website, I have nothing. But I also agree that CSO has a lot of uh, information and whoever is able to or wants to check on my website uh, is... Uh, I think it's Fernanda Leite Ribeiro, all put together, and then you can get there. That's all. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah, and I'll make sure I, I put a link for that if you'd like. And um, one of the, the the final things that I I remember writing in my notes, um, and it's I was happy to see. That, that you said it in your in your talk because it's something that I've kind of come to myself um, based on my own experience and and also what, what I've shared with my students is you were talking about how stereo pairs are sort of like shortcuts um, and you said something along the lines of they they unify all visual skills into one practice uh, I think you were talking about that a little bit earlier um, but that, that was one of the things I remembered. And then the other thing I remembered was the red cyan glasses that you had us playing with in the workshop as well. So sometimes those things can be like entire, you know, topics in and of themselves. But um, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up just to see if you had any kind of final thoughts around this whole, like using these stereo pairs or if people have access to the um, anaglyph glasses or, or things like that. Anaglyph glasses are a step to get into a stereoscopy because there are still, um, what they do to you is to separate both eyes. It's as if you had a septum separating everything and each entity, don't, they don't work as a pair. That's why it's so tiring to work with red and green glasses or red and sienna glasses. Mm -hmm. So this is a step of awareness again, just like Brock strings or the septum 
any of those, they all show how each eye works separately from the other one. But the red and green glasses are more challenging. And we call that biocular work, not binocular work, because they, you don't fuse. You fuse consciously in the anaglyph um, sheets. Then you can do that. But anyway, this is one step. When you use polarized glasses uh, and uh, the sheets, uh, the polarized tint, tinted sheets, you have the same experience, but it's a little less um, challenging because uh, red and green are more, they separate more, they are more, uh, it's a, one eye is completely different than the other and in the polarized node. So it's much more, more restful. Mm. Yeah, it's much more relaxing. Uh, on the other hand, they are five, six times more expensive. So <laughs> yeah, that's one problem. It's a big problem. Yeah, because the red, the red cyan ones, you know, little car foldable cardboard things with the the plastic. Uh... Yes, and then it, but not the glass. The glasses are cheap for both. The yeah. problem is the the sheets. Mm. Like a difference, like twenty dollars for one hundred and fifty. That's the difference, more or less. So it's more professional thing. Then you you won't have that at home. Mm -hmm. We cannot Xerox and give them out uh, those things. Right. Uh, this is uh, this is a problem actually, but anyway, uh, so this is a kind of work that is it's a step. It's very important when you balance both eyes. And remember, in that workshop uh, we were doing with those uh, two filters, one red and one green, uh, uh, glued at the glass of the window. Yeah, and then you had to look through with the red and green glasses, and then you see how much you can see through from each eye. So it's always telling you, it's always giving you awareness. And it's amazing that sometimes when you move your arm, your right arm, not, not even, you're not dealing with the hood, but you are bringing awareness to the side of your body, you have a shift there mm. on, on the transparency. And so this is, this is very interesting on the step. And all work with red and green glasses uh, is a work that bring both eyes consciously together. And then you go to the stereopsis itself. When you see the relief out or in, uh, the, in the convergency exercise and in the divergence exercise, you, have, you, you, you can do that in a free space, like sheets like that, that you drink. Uh, the third image, you build the third image because you are pointing your eyes in the, in the place and space. So the, the whole thing is to learn how to put your eyes where you want, wherever you want. So I want to put both eyes here. If I do, I have three images perfectly done in this two, three columns. And the third column, the middle column, will be in stereopsis. Yeah. If I'm doing uh, convergency, it's coming uh, towards me. If I'm doing divergency, it's going behind. And you just learn how to be flexible with that and to play with this. And there's thousands of things that you can do, even those games that you have in books, nice stereograms, hidden things that you can find. It's, this is all practice of stereopsis. And you see that every time you're doing this, it takes a while until your brain grasps it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. grasps, it, it takes a while to have the full experience. Right. It's not like that. Right? So this is the thing. This is the magic operating. This is the something that is not coming from each eye. It's something else. Mm. And it's funny because I'm writing that in my chapter. Awesome. Chapter, right? Yeah, exactly this. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's a third thing. And you only know how big it is when you don't have it, because it's right. so 
Yeah, that that was always what I tried to kind of wrap my head around since I always did have stereo vision. I, I would think about people like Dr. Sue Barry or or anybody who who I had a vision student who didn't get three dimensional vision until she turned 84. And I was just trying to think about spending 84 years with, you know, more kind of two dimensional seeing. And then all of a sudden you're in this new world in, in your eighties and, uh, and, and just like rediscovering the world in, in a new way. But, but yeah, that's like why I have two eye charts side by yeah, side the third. so that I, I converge and, and yes. I get the third one. And mm-hmm. what, what I teach to my students is it, usually it has four levels, like level one is just to get the third chart, but then I might lose it or it isn't stable. So then the second level would be getting it and then holding it a little more stably. But then the third level would be getting it and holding it even while moving or blinking or swinging or moving the chart. But what you said is like, it might take some time for the brain to grasp it. So to me, that sounds like level four, which is getting it, holding it, swinging it, and it gets all three dimensional and maybe even super sharp and clear because that's what I saw with my chart. When I would just look at it normally and see two charts, since I had the myopia, it was blurry, couldn't really get that far down the chart. When I would stand 20 feet away and converge and get the third one, I could get down to the 2020 line because that third image was like you were saying, it wasn't just a product of the two eyes. It was some other dimension that was getting involved um, that, that then carried over or translated into when I just would go back to looking at it normally without the convergence. So that that's why I always kind of point to the stereo pairs and this, this fusion work as one of the main things that I attribute to like getting back to the 2020 level Yeah. If people haven't tried that, definitely either maybe we can provide like a a little copy or a PDF of that, that chart with the circles that you shared, or Ah, maybe I can. It's very easy. I I can, I can send you one. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Maybe I'll uh, be able to add a a link to the uh, description where people can download that and print it out and try it because yeah, I had a lot of fun with it and I got a lot of, results from that practice in particular this is it and remember that oliver sacks you know who oliver sacks is was an english british neurologist and very nice guy who wrote a lot about vision including about sue barry and everything and he has a book called, called The Mind's Eyes. And in, in that book, he tells that he was a, he belonged to a stereo club. <laughs> People who were very fond of stereograms and they would play together. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that was the first time that I heard that you can improve your, your stereopsis. Like oh, that. wow. Yeah. By practice. I love that. Yeah, the stereo club. Yeah, we can build one also. We have the Bates group, the stereo group. Right, yeah, yeah. We got the Better Eyesight League. We got the whole the whole community. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just love nerding out about this stuff. That's why I love the conferences so much because we just get multiple days in a row of just getting to immerse ourselves and, and be absorbed in it and uh, and go walk around in the park with our, our field dividers on and um so be weird with everybody right? yes yeah <laughs> well it's been an absolute pleasure being weird with you today fernanda i was really looking forward to this and um and yeah i i, I just love your approach on how it it kind of takes honestly it kind of takes some of the pressure off of us in terms of like really just trying to drill into that you know perfect vision just in the middle And it sounds like you're kind of on this mission to really expand people out, you know, not just to the left and the right, like you said, but to really this entire, you know, massive visual field that we, we can kind of play with. And I feel like the more people do that, the the more relaxed they're going to be, the more maybe curious and fun it's going to be. 
Because I think earlier you said that when you do that, it gives you easy focus. Like when you're aware of the periphery, it makes it easier to focus. And the opposite of that to me is, is hard focus, which sounds kind of like the old way of like squinting or staring or kind of drilling in and overemphasizing just the middle. So really appreciate you reminding us about the integration of the whole visual field and, and really excited for people to keep experimenting on it on themselves and, and see what's possible. And I have to thank you so much because, you know, this is not work. This is totally pleasure. It's a, this is the thing I love the most. Talk, chat about that. <laughs> this is like party for me. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, it definitely comes through. I can definitely tell. Thank you again, Fernanda. This was awesome. Thank you.